Hello, everyone, and welcome to another More Talks from Thomas More University, where we present short, powerful talks devoted to spreading ideas, thoughts, and information to our community. I'm your host, Michael Orr, and uh, today I am very excited to introduce our panelists. Uh, we are talking about libraries today, and I'm very honored to be joined by Dave Schroeder, Executive Director of the Kenton County Public Library, Mike Wells, Director of the Thomas More University Benedictine Library, and Donna Bach, Youth Services Manager for the Boone County Public Library Shaven Branch. Thank you all so much for joining me today. Uh, I know that we're gonna keep having people come in as well as we keep going. Uh, I just wanna give a quick reminder that this More Talk is being recorded and will be made available on Thomas More University's More Over website. We're gonna be sending a link out to its location uh, with the email that follows this presentation. So if you find this talk engaging and thought provoking, please go out and share it with your friends and family and everyone in your community. Uh, and without further ado, I'm very excited to have uh, my three panelists here today. Uh, Dave, if you don't mind starting out, giving yourself a brief introduction. Sure, uh, I'm Dave Schroeder. I'm a Thomas More graduate of class of 90, then went on and got my master's degree in history from the University of Cincinnati, and then my master's degree in library science from the University of Kentucky. <clears throat> I worked at the Kenton County Library for 10 years uh, and then returned to Thomas More uh, where I was the um, college archivist in those days and an adjunct history uh, instructor. And then I've been back at the library for 20 years, um, seven of those as local history librarian and then the last 13 as director. Fantastic. And we're so glad to have you here today. Uh, Mike Wells, if you uh, don't mind giving yourself a brief introduction. Sure. I'm Mike Wells. I'm library director here at Thomas More University. Been here since April of 2018, so about two and a half years. And um, prior to that, I was a systems librarian at Northern Kentucky University. And I've worked in libraries for about 13 years now and IT uh, for about 20 years. So we'll talk about technology and libraries, I'm sure, later. So I'm sure we will with the amount that uh, it is becoming an increasing part of, of the role there. Um, and Donna Bach, can you introduce yourself real quick? Sure, I'm Donna Bach uh, and I am the Youth Services Manager, like you said, at the Shaven Branch of Boone County Public Library. Um, I'm, almost, I'm also a Thomas More grad. I graduated in 09 um, with an elementary education degree and, um, and then I went to the University of North Carolina to get my uh, Master's of Library Science. So I've been working in education, I would say, for over the last 10, 10 11 years. Um, some of it in formal education as a classroom teacher and other forms um, and other kinds of science centers um, and other kinds of non-traditional education. And um, I've been in the library world uh, for about six, six, seven years. Uh, and I started my life as a teen librarian um, and now moved into a management role. And so kind of looking at a wider variety of youth services. Well, all of them very important I, I, and uh, really relevant now, especially with the amount of people that are uh, utilizing library services for their children at home. So uh, I'm sure we'll get to talk about that as well. Uh, to start off, uh, so we're talking a lot about uh, resources that are available. Uh, you, all three of you work in very different roles and kinds of libraries, uh, from Dave as a director and uh, Mike as a director of an academic library and Donna in the youth services sector. Uh, what do you guys see as your mission at the library and what do you see as the mission of your center in the library? I'll, I'll go first. I'll just say um, our, our mission is pretty clear. It's to support the students, staff, and faculty at Thomas More University in any way we can. Uh, that's somewhat challenged, of course, physically now with COVID-19 and, and what we're experiencing uh, relating to the start of the semester and planning for that. Uh, but we have online resources and we've made a lot of strides in that area. So supporting the mission of the, the students, uh, whether they be online or whether they be physical here on campus, that's our goal. And uh, trying to really integrate library resources into the classroom has been a big push that we've made these last couple of years. Ours is pretty basic too. Um, I mean, our um, we've distilled our mission statement down to a tagline, <laughs> which is preserve yesterday, enrich today, inspire tomorrow. So um, um, the preserve yesterday is my my field of expertise for many years, which is you know our history and genealogy department. 
um, enriching today is providing services to the people of Kenton County, be that educational or recreational, um, and um, you know, enriching tomorrow. So, um, you know, thinking about the future and what we're doing as a library to make sure that we're um, building library users for the future and also making sure that we're providing services to the youth in our community to make sure they have everything they need uh, from their public library. Our mission statement is also pretty simple. It's discover, <laughs> explore, experience a lifetime of learning at Boone County Public Library. So, and in that lifetime of learning and new services, we focus on the littlest humans. Yeah. Um, so in our department, a lot of the focus that we have is on family engagement, whole family engagement, and giving the youngest humans uh, the skills and the tools that they need to be successful and to become lifetime library users. So we focus on early literacy skills um, and preschool, support, kindergarten readiness, that kind of thing. Excellent. Um, you know, while the mission statements are, are clear and they do, like you said, they can be refined down into these almost, like you said, Dave, taglines, um, you do encompass a large number of needs. Um, you know, I think, you know, uh, some people may have the perception that libraries are just a place you go for books, but I think we all know here that there's so much more than that. Uh, what do you guys see as the biggest need that your library or area serves? I think from, from our perspective in Kenton County, um, it's, it's meeting the digital, you know, the digital requests that we're getting. So everything from databases through our uh, schools, home schools, um, and um, e-materials, so uh, electronic materials. We were one of the, if not the first public library in Kentucky to have e-books. Um, we've had them for over 20 years and I still have to tell people we have e-books, which, you know, it's frustrating, but um, yeah, people still are surprised that libraries provide e-books. Um, and so um, working with, you know, how many people are using electronic materials versus real materials and how that impacts the budget um, is a constant challenge for us. Um, I think also meeting new needs. Um, we opened a stream center a couple of years ago, which is our STEM based center that's been extremely successful. Um, and that's ballooned. Uh, another thing that I think, you know, a lot of our, uh, a lot of people in the community would be surprised. And one of the things that we have moved strongly towards is workforce development. Um, we have a um, a very robust workforce development program uh, where we're doing classes. We have an accountability group that's drawing 90 people a week. Um, we have um, just last week we placed um, about five people in positions through that group. Um, and so we work very closely with the state and with other agencies in Northern Kentucky so we're not duplicating services. So um, we have a memorandum of understanding with about 15 different agencies in Kentucky and we're part of that uh, in Northern Kentucky as focusing on workforce development. So I think people would be surprised how much their libraries, be they academic, be they public, be they special, be they school, are really doing and how much they've changed from when they remember, you know, libraries. Yeah, and now go a little bit off of that too, Dave. Um, in since we're both in in public libraries for youth services, a lot of what we're looking at in Boone County um, is kindergarten readiness scores. Mm -hmm. It's one that we look at regularly, and um, you know we just got our new scores for the year. So in Northern Kentucky, we're looking at how many of our what's the what's the dynamics mm -hmm. of our community. Um, how are they changing? Um, and how we can best support them. So for right now, in Boone County, we have about 50 per, 55% overall of our children are ready for kindergarten, um, which is an okay number, um, but really nationally and where we wanna be, it's not great. Um, so some of the services that we focus on is providing outreach services that focus on the youngest of our patrons, um, and getting them ready, focusing on the families and developing their overall literacy skills as a family um, to really support that early literacy skills in the young ones and get them as ready as we can. 
One of the things that we have been dealing with here for most of the time I've been here is uh, the need for space, you know, and, and our students need a place to study. They need a place to come and, and have different types of space. Sometimes it's dynamic and, and lively and sometimes it's quiet study. They, they just need to be alone and have some time to digest what they need to learn. And uh, that has changed quite a bit recently, of course, because we've been closed so much. And, and so the online services have been more the need what we're feeling uh, at this time. So, uh, but in normal circumstances, what we really deal with are, are people wanting to be in here and study and be in here as late as possible. So we're open typically until midnight, but uh, you know, I know there are people who are here wanting to be here beyond midnight. So space is a big issue on our campus, I think, and the library tries to fill that need as best we can. I think, I think that's a key point too for public libraries in that we have become third spaces in the community. There are very few places that, that people can go to in the community um, that are free. You know, when you come to the public library, we're not asking you for anything, you know? We're here to provide you with things. We're here to provide you with space, and materials. And so um, public libraries in the last 10 to 15 years have become very much third spaces. They become places where everyone is welcome. And you know, and, and we really take that mission, and I know Boone County does as well, take that, we take that mission very seriously. And we're open for everyone in the community. And it's, you know, as we become more fragmented society, those third places have become rarer and rarer. And really, you know, we segregate ourselves in so many different ways in our communities of where we live, where we go to school, all of those things. Public libraries, and I, I refer to our Covington branch in particular as the bedroom, or the living room, sorry, of Kenton County. It's the place where everybody is welcome where everybody can come we don't turn people away you know and it's just a great third space for people to be one of the things we talk about too is connection and the need for connection in our society um, and i think we as libraries do a really important service connecting people with materials that they need connecting people with other people um, who are also resources in their community um, and connecting families, connecting history. Uh, it's a big, it's a big important piece. Yeah, it really is kind of hard to, to tailor down and narrow down, you know, what needs a library serves. It, it, so many needs are served there. Um, you, you all have talked a lot about space and about interactions between individuals, which I think everyone is aware has changed radically in the past six months, uh, the spaces that we can use and the, and the needs for those spaces and how we can interact with them. Uh, how have you guys seen the roles of libraries change in the past six months and how have libraries adapted to those changes uh, to fit the needs of a population that's changing? Who wants to go first on that one? <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll jump in. Um, you know, I think that fr the most frustrating thing for us is, that, you know, we're the people who come to work with us and the people that we're looking for are people, you know, they want to work with people. And so, you know, we have, you know, scaled back what we can do because of safety precautions and all of those issues. And so, um, you know, we're not able to do in-house programming, for instance, which is one of the things that we're known for in the community. Um, and so, we, you know, we've had to kind of look at our staff and how we're using them and what they do and, and you know, turn on a dime and, and make sure that we're meeting other needs. You know, one of the big things that we're, we're looking at right now is, you know, our school districts in Kenton County are public and private. You know, how are they going to function and what does that mean for us and how can we support our schools? And, you know, they're changing as the situation changes. And so we're kind of, you know, right on their heels, making sure that we're trying to catch up with them. And, and I'm sure Don, Don is doing the same thing just because, you know, you're working with young children. And so that's been extremely challenging to keep up with, you know, what is happening. And, you know, we've kind of learned that every day is a new day. 
the, the old normal is gone. You know, it's, it's like, you know, we hope someday to get to back to somewhere near that. But, you know, right now, every day is a new day and every day is a new challenge. And so we just, you know, have learned to change and modify and um, be creative very quickly. One of the things that in my experience here, Thomas Moore, it actually dates back to two years ago when I was interviewing for the job. Uh, my wife was actually a student in the TAP program and uh, just looking over her shoulder as she was taking classes and things, I realized, okay, I'm going to interview to be the library director at Thomas More, and, and I'm not seeing any presence in her online program for the library. It was very limited. So as things evolved and I ultimately were, was brought in and hired here, I made digital and, you know, a priority. We wanted to be more integrated in the online classroom. We wanted to be a part of um, our, our learning management system and, and do those things that we needed to do, regardless of how many people were learning online or how many people were learning in person. We needed to really up our game in that area. So for the first two years, um, we really focused on expanding our, our digital operations, getting more databases, getting better systems in place to service our students. And as COVID-19 evolved, and as we got into you know, February and March of this year, we realized we were very strongly positioned for what we had to turn on a dime, basically, and uh, not come back from spring break and, and not have students physically in here. And really to make that adjustment, we didn't have to do a whole lot as a library. We were pretty much ready for um, that event as much as we could be ready. We did have to do you know, some adjustments, of course, this summer, and we're in the process of those adjustments with the physical building. And we're kind of flying and fixing the plane at the same time right now. We'll, we'll see how this goes. But I think, you know, the online readiness, um, you know, it was it was motivated in a completely different frame of mind two years ago, but it prepared us for what we face now. And I think, um, you know, we'll see how it, how it goes forward, but I still view the library, at least the academic library, we're kind of a 50-50. 50% online and we're 50% in person. And we really have to, you know, we're, going to have to shift the focus right now back to the in-person and how do we handle COVID-19? How do we handle um, the volume of people who come in and out of the library? Um, and and we, we're pretty well positioned in the other 50%. So, you know, online, I think we're going to just go into cruise control and help people as best we can through video reference and things like that. Uh, but we'll see how the start of the semester plays out. And I think for us, some of the conversations we've been having uh, in this post-COVID world um, is really about getting back to our roots as a library, getting back to some of those essential functions. Um, as Dave was saying, we love people. <laughs> That's how we got into this job. Uh, and especially in new services, the families, the children, seeing them, interacting with them is our favorite, favorite part. Uh, and so not being able to do that in the same way um, has been a challenge. And so we have been forced to enter into this virtual world. Um, and it's something that we've always, you know, sort of dipped our toes in a little bit. And this has really challenged us to go all the way uh, and really get into it, figure out what's working best for us uh, and how we can still engage with families uh, and make those meaningful relationships and impacts um, while not being able to share the same space um, with all of our families. Um, but really the, the essential functions of still making connections and providing materials. When we were able to reopen in any capacity, you know, it was for curbside. And I think our staff who normally have a large variety of jobs and roles in the library, we're finding that we're all doing the same stuff. <laughs> we're all checking in materials, we're all shelving materials. Um, and really getting back to that, that core piece of getting information into the hands of people who want and need it. All, all true. And um, I, I also, by the way, I want to encourage our audience, if you have questions, our chat is open. 
uh, I'd be more than happy to moderate your questions for our librarians as well. Um, I know there's been a lot of changes recently, so it might be a good time to, to ask some questions if you have them. But um, Mike, something that you said, you know, about having to fix the plane and fly it at the same time, uh, I think uh, definitely resonates with me. I think it resonates with a lot of people. Um, do you guys feel that um, like taking away the adaptations and the changes that you've had to make in the six months that have preceded this, uh, do you think there are going to be any permanent takeaways or any permanent changes that you've seen? Anything that you guys have learned that you think is going to have a long-term effect on how you perceive the role of the library or, or where you see the direction moving? I, I can speak for us. I, I do think we will change quite a few things um, on, you know, as we get on the other side of this crisis, uh, based off of what we've had to do. One of the things that we're doing right now uh, is we've separated the concept of our hours and our hours of operation here. Um, there's always been, since I've been here, the the folks who come into the library tend to come in for the classrooms and other other entities within the library and not so much to come in to use our library service or reference questions or things like that. So what we're doing is we're splitting our hours and so we have hours of, of the building and then hours of library service. So uh, that I think we'll probably go forward with because that was something we we knew was happening before anyway because our space is utilized by other offices, uh, the classrooms and other purpose. So having some having a student worker here until midnight, um, especially in COVID-19, I, I just don't think it makes a whole lot of sense. So we're going to scale back. We just we are very big on statistics and assessment and counting door counts and question counts and all of these different things. And there statistically was no justification to to stay to physically staff the area, but yet we're going to make changes so that we can keep the building open for those who need a place and still need to study. So that's a big, um, I mean, if, if you could say it in this way, this has been a convenient time to make that change. Uh, we needed to probably make that change anyway. So. Um, I think two, two of the things that we have done, um, you know, we had about a week where we had to figure out how we were going to do programming and stay in touch with, with our patrons, uh, especially the little ones. Um, and so we moved all of our programming from in-house basically to online, which we had been wanting to do. We wanted to do some online programming for years, but we always found a reason not to. <laughs> And so this kind of forced us to, to do it. And so within a week, we were putting story times and you know, sing-alongs and you know, educational uh, information out online on Facebook Live, on YouTube, on Twitter, uh, anywhere we could get it out there on Instagram um, to make sure that we were meeting those needs. And they have been extremely popular. Um, one of the things that came out of that was we had some Spanish speaking families who asked if we could do a Spanish speaking story time. Um, and it has been hugely popular and we will continue to be doing all of, we're going to continue to do programming online. That's not going away. You know, it's been too successful to not do. Um, the other thing that, um, because, you know, we were closed for three months, um, we were pushing everybody to our digital materials. So folks who were typically coming in and checking out physical materials didn't have that option anymore. And so we were pushing them to use online, you know, eBooks. Um, and so we have created this group of folks who previously never used eBooks, you know, eBooks before, but now do. And so it has made me look at the budget when I prepared the budget for this year of how much money are we going to spend on e-materials as opposed to physical materials. And I'm getting close to 50, 50, um, which if you had told me five, six years ago, I'd have told you you were crazy. That was not going to happen. Well, it happened. Um, and I don't see that changing. I think we, we have converted those folks into e-readers. Uh, I think they will still come into the building for programming and they'll still want to have that physical book in their hand occasionally, but, Many of them really like the convenience of e-materials. And so um, that, that is a change that's not going away. And I'll, I'll echo that. This virtual programming is here to stay. 
And I think in a lot of ways, um, it provides us an opportunity to reach people we might not normally reach uh, and to have the things that we create and the programs that we do able to be shared and live on in a more lasting way to touch more people. Uh, but I, I really think that that's not going away, but it will become a supplement uh, to the things that we're already doing. With the, our story times, we're feeling like when we look at the, the metrics, right, for a virtual story time, we keep ours to about 12 minutes um, in order to engage with families. And then when we look at the metrics of how long a person will stay engaged with that video, it's a much shorter percentage of time compared to having an in-person story time where we have a wrapped audience for 30 to 45 minutes. Right. Um, and there's much more engagement between the families, um, not just with the story time programmer. So I don't think that the virtual world is going away. And in a lot of ways, I'm thankful that we've had this opportunity to really get into it um, and get experience with it and get more comfortable with it because it's, it's staying. Um, but I think as a supplement, to a lot of the things that we are able to provide in person in the future. Um, and then in other ways, this, you know, this world that we live in now has given us a chance um, to kind of reevaluate and refocus some things. Um, we're looking at specifically at our youth services outreach. Um, and outreach is something that um, I think a lot of people don't realize how much outreach the libraries do to schools, to childcare centers, to preschools, um, to areas all over the county, on um, different communities throughout the county. And in some ways, we like to say yes to all of those things mm -hmm. and to get out there and to, to meet people we, that aren't coming into our building um, to hopefully get them engaged. But what we're finding is because we say yes so much, you know, we might be working out of our capacity and this time has given us a pause to really think about our services, think about our staffing, um, and kind of refocus our efforts where that largest need is. Um, so we're, we're doing some of that uh, self-reflection um, right now. And I think the other change that's happened, and I think a lot of industry is experiencing this, not just libraries, is the way that our staff work. Um, in Boone County, we collaborate a lot as a system. Um, and so with this, we're having a lot more digital meetings um, so that the travel between the branches is almost non-existent now. Um, and so it's, it's changed a bit how we communicate internally uh, and how we train people and how we do that kind of thing. And that's not changing either. <laughs> Uh, one of the things a, a friend of mine said to me near the beginning of this was that he expected that um, this uh, global pandemic more than anything else would would hold a mirror up both to us as individuals and to areas of our society. And I think that uh, that's becoming clearer and clearer to be to be true uh, in terms of, you know, we're, like you said, Donna, taking the time uh, to assess things and to, to make changes where necessary that may be in directions we hadn't expected, but were older needs. Um, Donna, you addressed two things that I definitely want to uh, hit on, which are services that we may not expect a library to be filling, but has been filling, and then also the relationship that the library has with other parts of the community, particularly schools. Um, I want to start, because I think the schools is a bigger issue, and I would definitely want to talk about that uh, as well, um, but I want to start with uh, just, you know, a question, what what do you see as the roles that your library serves that are kind of the most overlooked that people uh, don't take as much advantage of as you as you think they probably could and, and would like to make people more aware of? Some of the, you know, in this pre-COVID world, I would definitely say a lot of our online databases um, and resources that we had in there, um, as Dave was talking about converting people to e ebook ebook readers. Um, and, and that has definitely changed. I think a lot more of those are getting seen. Um, when it comes to services that we provide that we wish were utilized more, uh, some of ours in new services that we look at are the services to teachers. Um, we do have teacher cards. Um, we're looking at expanding our opportunities for, for educator um, cards and student access, student like digital access cards um, and teacher collection requests that teachers can use 
and as well as the supplemental materials for the classroom. Um, so I, I do think that those in just the normal, normal routines of schools uh, are not always utilized as much as they could be. So that's one thing that we expect to be highlighted and to change um, with this new atmosphere and the new sort of schooling model um, that we're looking at. I would agree. I think um, a lot of what we do with the schools um, is overlooked or um, isn't fully utilized. You know, teacher cards is a good one. Uh, we also do um, collection, you know, we'll do specific collections for teachers who are working on a particular project. Um, we try to get to every public, private, parochial school in the county at least once a year. Most of them we get to multiple times during the year. Um, but just getting, um, you know, getting teachers to see what we have to offer, um, I think is, is something that we're always working on and always trying to move forward. Um, our, our workforce development pr um, program has, has received a lot of attention. And so we've almost got more than we can manage at this point. Fortunately, we just got a grant um, that'll allow us to hire a few more staff to help us out with that, which is great. Um, another thing I think people um, maybe don't realize is we have a tool lending library uh, on Pike Street in Covington. It's called Empower Tools. It's been there for about four or five years uh, where people can come in and uh, check out tools, everything from power washers to rakes to, um, um, you know, any kind of tool imaginable. Uh, we pretty much have leaf blowers, you know, just things that people need to maintain their houses, fix their houses up and those kinds of things. And so uh, it was a grant and uh, we continue to get that grant and we're continuing to pitch in a little bit of our own money to make it happen. Um, but it was a cooperative program through um, the Center for Great Neighborhoods and um, the Kenton County Library and a few other groups. Um, and um, it, it provides wonderful services to people who necessarily don't want to go out and buy a power washer to do this one project, but you can come in and check it out. And it's just, you just bring in your card and you're like checking out this huge piece of equipment, but it's the same thing as checking out a book or the same thing as checking out, a, you know, uh, a video, except you're checking out a tool. So, um, you know, we're, we're looking at those things and, you know, how we're contributing back to the community and what our role is in the community and um, and that's something that I think a lot of people would be surprised that we do. I think one of the things we're gonna work on more in a future context and it's kind of beginning right now, um, we have our Thomas More room which is upstairs here in our library and we want to evolve it and change it and turn it more into a true special collections room uh, to kind of highlight the history of the institution. Um, along those lines, earlier this year, we made our first contribution into the Kentucky Digital Library um, with the collection of documents that we had uh, regarding Gregor Mendel and, and, and some prior research that had been done here. Uh, years ago, and I know Dave's familiar with a lot of that, uh, having worked here and seen seen what we have. Uh, but I think there's a lot of potential there for the Thomas More Room. We do have some some uh, volumes in there that date back to the 1500s, 1600s. Things that I feel need to be preserved, and we need to do a better job with it. So that's a future focus, and that's something that a lot of our students, if they knew about the room, they knew it as a place to sneak off and study, uh, not necessarily for what it holds. And so we want to really kind of evolve that and kind of give it, give, you know, some institutional history and, and uh, grow that for our students. Excellent. And as someone that dearly loves the Thomas More Room uh, and the resources that are there, I knew it as a student as a classroom, uh, but it was also just one of my absolute favorite spaces. I, I'm very excited. Uh, to hear that you're looking at moving in that direction. I would love to see more people experience that because there's incredible materials there. Mm -hmm. um, Dave, as well, on uh, Empower Tools is one of the coolest things that I've seen a library do. As uh, a serial apartment renter uh, and not a homeowner, I can tell you having the availability through the library to get those tools without having to find the space without a shed or a garage is just makes city living possible for, for me and I'm sure for 
for many other people to support themselves. So glad you're uh, using it. Yeah. Hey, it's awesome. <laughs> uh, I plan on getting a power washer from you guys next week. So we'll be in touch. Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, Donna, I want to return back to what you were talking about uh, with your interactions with the school systems. Um, I'm sure those have become, those conversations probably uh, have changed a lot in this past year. And uh, for all of you, really, um, your relationships with outside institutions. Um, I know that I've used the uh, interlibrary loan system through Thomas More's library a fair amount as well. Um, I would just like to know what uh, your relationships like with other schools or with, or for the public libraries for school systems have been like, what's that level of communication been like and what are you expecting it to be like for this coming fall? Yeah, we have been very fortunate in Boone County to have a really uh, great working relationship and open lines of communication with our school system for a while. We've, we've partnered with them um, very closely in the past on various projects. Um, summer reading is one of the biggest ones that we've tackled in the past with them. Um, and like Dave mentioned, we do have liaisons for all of our schools um, in the Boone County School District, as well as those parochial ones as well. And we try and keep lines of communication open as much as possible. It's an ever-changing environment. Um, in, uh, administrators change, instructors and teachers change, uh, our staff changes. So it's, it's a constantly evolving um, and and a relationship that does take attention. And it's one that we feel deserves a good amount of attention and effort to maintain. And uh, so it's something that we're always thinking about and working with them as much as we can. Uh, sometimes they approach us with projects that they are really excited about and want us to, to collaborate with them on. And sometimes it comes from us, it goes both ways. As far as how it's going to look in the future, <laughs> you know, it's still a big giant question mark. Right. I think schools are really still trying to figure out how to best function um, on their own. And like Dave said, we are right behind them, um, excited and eager to participate as much as we can and to support them as much as we can. And I think we're still figuring out what that's going to look like. So there, we have some ideas, we have some suggestions that are that are being talked about and are being discussed, but I don't think anything is totally sure at this point. I think One of my favorite things about being a librarian is uh, the ability and the, the, the opportunity to work with other librarians at different institutions. Mm -hmm. Having worked at NKU, uh, I have a close connection with a lot of folks over there. And as I've um, seen their response to COVID-19 and the situation on different campuses in the region. Um, I've, you know, tried to borrow uh, as much as I can from other institutions on making the best decision for us. Um, so I have open lines of communication with uh, NKU and other, other area schools and also the Kentucky Virtual Library and, and some of the other schools around the state too. And that's, that's really been one of my favorite things about being a librarian is this uh, being able to collaborate and list serve messages that come in and out every day, some of which I can't read all of them, but you read and understand what other people are doing in response to all of this. So. One of the things that uh, we're doing with our schools, um, typically each branch had a group of schools that they kind of catered to. So we divided up the county in that way. Um, we're just saying with this new, you know, situation we're dealing with right now that that's probably not the most efficient way we're going to be able to work in the future. And so we're going to be pulling all of those school services into one um, outreach uh, area that uh, I can't talk too much about because we're still in the process of pulling it together. We just had a meeting this morning on this. Um, but, you know, we're very conscious of what's happening with the schools and what's happening with parents who are going to be doing NTI and how all that's going to work and how childcare fits into that. And, you know, it's just, there's so much that parents are dealing with right now with their young children and they're not so young children about how this is gonna work, you know, and, and how are we gonna make this work? And so 
we are refocusing some of those efforts that we have done in the past with schools in a different way to make sure that uh, we are more efficient, more effective, and more nimble in making sure that we can meet those teachers' needs, whether it be NTI and using Zoom or Teams or uh, Google Classrooms um, or being in the classroom because we know some schools are going to be in the classroom. Um, so um, we're, you know, reutilizing re some of our staff, particularly in children's services, in a way that we have not in the past to make sure we're meeting those needs of, of the schools and the parents and the kids, most importantly. Um, and, you know, our role is to make sure that we're meeting those, those kids' needs and those teachers' needs. And, and doing that, ha it means we have to change the way we do things. And um, we've, we have, um, COVID has made us do that, you know. Um, and it's, I think it's been a good thing in, in a lot of ways. It's, it's stirred people up a little bit. It's made people think about their jobs and, and what they do and how they do it. And maybe the way we were doing it worked, but maybe that's not the way we need to do it now. And so, um, you know, it, it's, it's great that we have, we have a staff that's been very uh, willing to try new things and to look at new situations and figure out how to make it work. And so, uh, we're working really well together to make sure that we're meeting those needs of those schools. And that, that's right now is the focus that we're working on um, to make sure that whatever happens in the schools, we can provide services. Oh, Michael, you're muted. I'm muted. I do it about once, about once per more talk. Um, <laughs> I think that uh, we did have a question from the audience about uh, NTI or, or non uh, NTI options and uh, how those related. Dave, I think those, uh, I think your answer directly related to that. Um, if Donna or Mike, if you want to directly uh, touch on those as, as well, you're, you're more than welcome to. Um, but we are uh, coming up on 45 minutes. So um, I did, uh, just wanted to give you guys an opportunity uh, to just, you know, if there's a message that you have from your library or from yourself uh, about, you know, the library uh, that you want to talk about or what you're excited about for the future of the libraries, um, I want to give you an opportunity to share that. And then also, if you have a favorite book, uh, one of my favorite things to talk about with librarians is their recommendations. So if you have a favorite book or uh, books that you want to recommend, I also want to give you guys the opportunity to, to share those as well. So um whoever wants to get started uh we're good to go i went first last time <laughs> <laughs> I, I think from an excitement standpoint of, of what i could be you know say that i'm excited about or hopeful for for our library would be you know phys what we've done online with digital technology has, has been great and expanding our resources but to the idea of, of doing some physical technology improvements with the library. Um, last summer, I, I got to go over to Xavier University and uh, kind of had an exchange visit with their library director. He came here and I went over there and they have a virtual reality uh, set up that I got to do for the first time. And as a technology guy, I kind of thought, well, you know, I thought, well, it's it's a novelty. I didn't really think a whole lot about, you know, virtual technology and, or virtual reality in the context of, of the classroom. But once I wore the headset and got into the world and kind of saw, you know, like a human body and all of these different things, I, I saw the pedagogical connection and I saw the relevance of it for a library to be involved and have such technology. So I'm hopeful that we can, you know, do a makerspace or a virtual reality lab or something like that in the future. Um, you know, that'll take time. It's not something we can do overnight, but yeah, I do see it as an exciting place for, you know, the library itself, so. I would be very excited to see that on campus. I'm sure several of our students would be too. One of the things that we hearken back to um, and we talk a lot about is stories, the importance of stories um, and the library being a place where stories are created, where stories are housed, 
where stories are preserved um, and where stories can continue. Uh, and so that is definitely something that is not going away. Libraries aren't going anywhere. Um, and when it comes to especially families and connecting families, supporting young families, young children, uh, those services will, all, there will always be a need for that. Um, so that is definitely something that gives me hope um, and looking towards the future. Uh, the way that we provide those services will definitely change over time, um, but the, the need is always going to be there. Uh, and that is definitely something that we will always be there to support. Um, we can talk about favorite books later. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I think the hope that I have uh, for libraries is the, the consistency of service. Um, when it comes right down to it, that's what we are. We're a service institution. You know, we're here to serve the public. And be it that online, be that in person. Um, we prefer in person, obviously, uh, as Donna and I have both discussed. You know, we're people, you know, we like to be with people. We like to serve people face to face. and. I think um, that time period when we were shut down, you know, is very frustrating for all of us because we missed our patrons and they missed us. And I remember when we opened our drive through windows at all three locations, um, we had a line here at the Erlanger branch that people were waiting 90 minutes in line to pick up holds. And I was walking up and down that row of cars and just talking to people, you know, who my mask on and was saying, thank you for waiting. And we're so glad you're here. And people were just so excited to be able to get through the drive through and pick up a book. And, you know, little kids jumping up and down in the seats because they were able to, you know, they were, they were getting their kids, you know, their books that they had had on hold for so long. And, it, you know, it was just such a, a reaffirming thing for me because, you know, I wasn't going to ask the staff to do something I wouldn't do. And so I was over there working the drive through too, and I took my turns on the desk and I did what I needed to do. Um, so, you know, they knew that I was in this with them. Um, but, you know, that, that gave me hope. I knew once we opened that drive through window, I knew those nine weeks that we were shut down or eight weeks we were shut down, that that wasn't the end. It was just a different beginning. And so that was really, you know, affirming for me. And I knew then that libraries were continued, would continue to exist as we always did. We were just going to be, it was going to be different. But we were still there to serve and we would make it happen. And that day proved it to me. And so uh, that was, that was a really... That was one of the highlights of my career, I think, that day. It was a rainy day. I didn't care. I was soaking wet. It was, I was just so excited to see all these people waiting in line. You know, we had to do barricades in the parking lot where people I had to kind of loop around the parking lot to keep them off the road. I'm like, you know, this says something about the importance of libraries and the importance of information and reading and, and libraries is a place. And so that was, that was something that uh, I'll never forget. That really is a fantastic story. And again, it, it just illustrates uh, the place that our libraries have in our community, uh, how central they are to so many people's lives, to what they do, to their hopes and aspirations, uh, to their academic futures in many, many cases. And so, um, yeah, if you guys have book recommendations, I kind of want them personally. Uh, <laughs> But I, 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 I want to close this out by letting you guys have the last word. And uh, yeah, if you have a book recommendation, feel free to give it. And if you want to throw in, you know, just a final word to our audience, uh, we'll close off with that. I'll start because I haven't started yet. Um, and uh, definitely for me, you know, I have spent a lot of time at home with my toddler that I probably would not have uh, prior to this. So the book that has been on my nightstand that I have been pouring over for months um, is actually called The Montessori Toddler <laughs> uh, by Simone Davies. And it is, I, I can't recommend it highly enough. I have a little bit of experience working in Montessori preschool. Uh, and um, while I'm not a Montessori teacher and I'm not certified for that, a lot of the um, ideals and practical solutions that it comes up with toddlers and young children have helped me uh, structure my home and st structure uh, our time together to be really helpful. And uh, so that's on my nightstand and it's been on my nightstand for months. <laughs> I, I keep going back to it. 
Um, and uh, I mentioned I have a toddler. I have a 20 month old daughter and the book right now that we read every day is um, there's a monster in your book <laughs> by Tom Fletcher. So if you haven't read that, it's, it's real fun. <laughs> um, I've been reading a lot as a stress relief kind of mechanism. So I, I you know, I try to read a book, a, a book a week. That's my goal. And I'm way ahead of it for this year. <laughs> um, but um, Blake Crouch, uh, Dark Matter, and he's followed up with a book called uh, Recursion. Uh, they're both sci-fi, which is very unusual for me. I usually don't read sci-fi. They're time, one's a time travel book. I've really enjoyed those. Um, and then um, I read a lot of nonfiction. As a historian, I, I like nonfiction. Um, and I just read one, um, I'm trying to find it here, sorry. It's a, um, I want to know, I want you to know we're still here. It's a post-Holocaust memoir. So it was a memoir about uh, a child who survived the Holocaust and, and what that did to her life and how that changed the way she raised her children. And it was, it was, it was very timely uh, for this time period, you know, the, uh, the transitions and the difficulties she faced and what we're facing. And, you know, it put what we're facing into perspective for me, <laughs> you know, um, you know, I'm be, I'm asking myself to wear a mask and, you know, to stay six feet apart. I'm not living the Holocaust, you know. Um, and so it, it put a lot of things into context for me, you know, that what we're dealing with, well, we're fine. We'll make, we'll make it through. People have dealt with much worse in the past. And, uh, and so we're, you know, we're fortunate with what we have and, uh, and we'll make it through it. As a, and I know we talked about this before the recording, as a dad, um, what I've been reading is how to build a tree house, basically, mm -hmm. and, and I've been working on a tree house for about six months now, so uh, I don't have the exact title, but it's a tree house book with blueprints and nice, helpful things for a non-carpenter like myself, so I've been reading that, and then uh, my son, we read books all the time, he's just got so many, um, but one thing that my mom gave me a book about a year ago and I didn't really read much of it, but it was, now I'm reading it. It's the Boy Scouts handbook from like 1925. Mm -hmm. Oh, cool. It, and it gives a very different mm -hmm. perspective of things. And I actually learned quite a bit, uh, you know, like practical things I never knew because I was never a Boy Scout. So, um, but it, it's, it's a real uh, interesting read all right before going to bed each night. So. Well, the, the James Beard house is, is just several blocks away from Dave Schroeder's Covington branch. So you guys may need to do a field trip together at some point. And we'll be doing walking tours again sometime soon, hopefully. Oh, excellent. Yes. So. Excellent. Yes. Well, I couldn't thank you all enough for joining me today. Thank you all for our audience for joining more talks. Um, if you did find this useful, if you're listening to this in the future, uh, please feel free to share this information. We want to get this in front of as many people as possible. And again, to my panelists, thank you all so much for your time. This has been a wonderful discussion, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Michael.